Guillermo del Toro has changed the face of modern filmmaking. He helped bring about the Mexican New Wave, he had a historic Best Picture win for an unabashed genre picture, and yet you'd never know that from looking at him. With the face of a cherub and a delightfully contrasting gravelly voice, del Toro isn't a huge fan of the limelight. He prefers to put himself into his work and let the faces in his films speak for him. And which face does del Toro use most frequently to represent him? Why this one, of course. What makes this gangly white man such a perfect stand-in for Del Toro? Find out on today's episode of Deadly Duos. In 1993, a young Mexican filmmaker by the name of Guillermo del Toro was making an audacious modern vampire movie that was equal parts beautiful, horrifying, complex, and tragic. Kronos starred Mexican TV actor Federico Lupi and American actor Ron Perlman, known best at the time for playing Vincent in Beauty and the Beast. The film was a Spanish-language arthouse horror film that made a surprising splash in the U.S., though it was produced on a low budget in Mexico. At the same time, One Country Away, actor Doug Jones had recently completed a part in Batman Returns and was shooting the role for which generations of children would remember him, Billy the Zombie in Disney's Hocus Pocus. Because of the bold vision of Kronos, American producers came calling on Del Toro to come to the U.S. and make a horror film with a larger budget and Hollywood resources. Del Toro settled on working with Dimension Pictures and Miramax to make Mimic. Producer Harvey Weinstein was not yet widely known as a rapist, but he did already have a reputation as a meddling asshole who exerted his will and power over productions at the cost of the director's vision, and Mimic was no exception. Del Toro fought constantly with Weinstein, and he would have been fired from the film if not for the intervention of Mira Sorvino, who threatened to walk if Del Toro was fired. The project was not a pleasant one for Del Toro, who disowned the film for many years, but one great thing came from the film because of a few days worth of reshoots in Los Angeles. They needed more shots of the insect creature in the run-up to the release, and their original actor for the insect was in Canada, so they called around for a tall, thin, talented physical performer to shoot new insect footage. He'd recently taken on creature roles in Tank Girl and 1995's The Legend of Galgameth, and it seemed like the giant insect of Mimic wouldn't be much different. Then, on day two of reshoots, he sat down for lunch and Del Toro sat down across from him. They got to talking about makeup and monsters and they hit it off tremendously. When lunch was over, Del Toro asked for Jones's card. Jones gave it to him and went back to his life. For the next five years, Jones added more diverse and impressive roles to his resume. Some were in big budget films that he hoped would catch on, but ultimately underperformed, like his appearance as superhero Pencilhead in Mystery Men, or his role as one of the mysterious Morlocks in 2002's The Time Machine. One of his most memorable roles of the era was as one of the villainous gentlemen in the silent episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Hush. But that business card he gave Del Toro years earlier was about to pay off in ways he didn't expect. After the bad experience of Mimic, Del Toro returned to Spanish-language filmmaking, this time working with Spanish producers on the coming-of-age period piece The Devil's Backbone in 2001. A chilling ghost story set in the Spanish Civil War, it was nominated for many awards, including the Goyas, Spain's most prestigious film awards. He followed that up the next year with a very different film, the dark vampire superhero film Blade II. His ability to balance action, horror, and emotion proved to be exactly what the franchise needed, and the film earned triple its budget back. Success with one comic book property meant he might be able to bankroll another one. Hellboy was a dream project he'd wanted to make since he first laid eyes on Mike Mignola's iconic shadow-heavy art. His previous successes proved worthy enough to greenlight the project, and Del Toro was making his dream come true. He knew after working with Perlman on Kronos that there was no actor better suited to play Hellboy than him. Perlman became something of a good luck charm to Del Toro, working with him several other times throughout his career. Wait a minute, is that a separate Deadly Duos? Okay, real quick, here's a mini Deadly Duos on Del Toro and Perlman's work together. Kronos, Blade 2, Hellboy, Hellboy 2, The Golden Army, Pacific Rim, The Book of Life, Troll Hunters, and the upcoming Pinocchio and Nightmare Alley. Whew. Okay, back to the original Deadly Duo. Perlman was the perfect Hellboy, John Hurt was a dead ringer for Professor Broom, and Selma Blair was great as the fiery Liz Sherman. 
But how was Del Toro going to put Abe Sapien on screen? A humanoid fish man with super intelligence, Del Toro knew CGI wouldn't do the character justice. Out came that business card, and Jones was brought in to play Abe Sapien. Though his voice was dubbed over by David Hyde Pierce in the first film, it is undeniable that Jones' performance brought that character to vivid life. He became so inextricably linked to Abe Sapien that Jones did provide the body and voice performance for the sequel film, Hellboy 2 The Golden Army. He also voiced every other appearance of Abe Sapien, including the two Hellboy animated films, Sword of Storms and Blood and Iron, and even in the video game Hellboy The Science of Evil. Their next collaboration was a massive achievement for Del Toro, and a massive challenge for Jones, in more ways than one. Pan's Labyrinth is a companion piece to The Devil's Backbone, another haunting children's tale set in Spain, this time a few years after the Spanish Civil War. Jones's challenges on this project were daunting. Not only would he be playing dual roles, one of those roles required speaking Spanish which Jones didn't even know. He was terrified of ruining the movie, but Del Toro told him he was the only one who could capture the complex animal-human movement needed for the performance. So Jones learned to speak Spanish for the role. The role and the performance were universally well-received, with the film nominated for six Academy Awards and winning three. It is consistently ranked as one of the best films of its decade, and it garnered both Del Toro and Jones accolades and respect. They almost immediately followed that film up with the Hellboy sequel, Hellboy 2, The Golden Army, an excellent comic book movie that was unfortunately lost a bit in a year that also boasted the releases of Iron Man and The Dark Knight. Jones ended up serving triple duty on that film, playing Abe Sapien, as well as Chamberlain and the Angel of Death, all distinct and unique characters that stand out in a crowded fantasy world. And then came the long dark. After the prestige and awards circuit, Del Toro was gifted with an amazing opportunity to direct The Hobbit, an epic prequel to Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy. It was the brass ring for a fantasy fan like Del Toro, and he leapt on the opportunity. But that meant moving down to New Zealand for a years-long process of pre-production before shooting would even begin. For a person with constant ideas like Del Toro, the long schedule and isolation was torture. Between 2008 and Del Toro's return years later, Jones racked up some impressive and wild performances. From the nightmarish Ice Cream Man in Legion to one of the infected in the American remake of Wreck called Quarantine, Jones was popping up everywhere. In a rare lead performance, Jones played an emaciated man possessed by the cannibal spirit of the Wendigo in the Larry Fessenden-directed episode of the horror anthology show Fear Itself called Skin and Bones. Eventually, Del Toro couldn't take the long wait on The Hobbit anymore and he left the project, though he is still credited as screenwriter on the trilogy. He dove right into the action with Pacific Rim, a robots punching monsters epic from 2013 that was CGI heavy and had no call for a nuanced, human-sized physical performance from Jones. But Del Toro was newly free to work on lots of things, and work he did. He co-wrote a series of vampire novels that he turned into a TV series for FX called The Strain. Del Toro was new to episodic television, but Jones wasn't. He'd done dozens of series as various monsters and creatures, and he was even appearing on TNT's sci-fi drama Falling Skies in 2014 when Del Toro asked him to play The Master, the main antagonist in The Strain. Jones ended up playing the enormous, pale, hairless vampire monster for six episodes across the show's four seasons. In his next collaboration with Del Toro, who'd already had him play every monster imaginable and learn a new language, Del Toro gave Jones a challenge he hadn't yet been dealt, playing a woman, too, actually. 2015's Crimson Peak was a gothic romance, and Del Toro cast Jones as a black-veiled mother specter and also the nightmarish deep red ghost hag. The set and costume design of the film are stunning and Jones's eerie performances perfectly matched the film's tone. The movie was well-received critically, but it didn't light the box office on fire. That would change with their next collaboration. Ever since Del Toro saw Creature from the Black Lagoon as a child, he loved the film and saw it as an unrequited romance. He was attached to a remake in 2002 that never materialized, but the thought of a monster-human romance was never far from his mind. In 2011, he started working on an idea about an aquatic monster developing a friendship with a female janitor in a Cold War research facility, and so the creation of The Shape of Water had begun. The script, from Del Toro and Vanessa Taylor, was a bold experiment in visual storytelling, creating a love story between two characters who could not speak. 
The acting duo was up for the task. Actress Sally Hawkins was a multiple award nominee when she signed on and was excited for the challenge. For Jones, though, it was everyday routine to communicate only through his bodily movements. The movie was an old-fashioned romance and a classic monster movie fused together, an epic vision captured for a shockingly low $20 million budget. The movie ended up earning nearly 10 times its budget back at the box office, and the widespread critical acceptance was remarkable for such a unique and specific film. It went on to be nominated for Academy Awards. It won four of those awards, including one for Del Toro as director and one for Best Picture. The one key player who was never nominated and rarely even mentioned, Doug Jones, the centerpiece of the film. So what does the future hold for this deadly duo? Well, Guillermo del Toro is busy working with Netflix on an adaptation of Pinocchio, a film he's wanted to make for over a decade. And along with that, he's also shooting a remake of the classic 1947 film noir, Nightmare Alley. And let's not forget his continuing animated series for Netflix, Troll Hunters, Three Below, and the upcoming Wizards. Jones's plate is pretty full right now, too. He had a recurring role on the television adaptation of the horror comedy What We Do in the Shadows on FX, and he is getting great reviews for his performance as Lieutenant Saru on the CBS series Star Trek Discovery. One thing is for certain, though. When Del Toro struck up a conversation with Jones that day on the set of Mimic Reshoots, he saw something in him. They were both monster fans for sure, and Del Toro certainly saw the potential of Jones as a canvas on which to paint some of the most iconic creatures that have appeared in his films. But deeper than that, Del Toro saw someone who understood what it was like to inhabit the soul of a creature, to make it as real and relatable as any human performance. And for a director whose entire career was built on making the monsters the heroes, Del Toro recognized a kindred spirit. There's no doubt we'll be seeing them work together on something in the future. What would you like that project to be? That's it for this episode of Deadly Duos. Join us again next time for another fantastic scare pair.